So imagine you have a polysemantic neuron pictured here. Uh, this is uh, within Pythia 70 million. This one neuron, right, this whole plot is for one neuron, activates for 15, it actually activates for 25, but only 15 here are showed, uh, different engrams. So again, just to, just to make sure people understand this, this is the activation of this neuron on the oven token. Do you want to zoom in a bunch? Yeah, even more. Yeah. So this is the activation of the oven token when preceded by international CA for international covenant versus all other types of ovens. So for example, this neuron cares about international covenants, but no other types of ovens. And likewise for gates, boosts, factors, and so on. Yes. Note international C and oven are two separate things because yes. models convert text into tokens and tokenizers right. are fucking cursed. So this is obviously like super annoying for interpretability researchers, right? Because like the way that we found this uh, neuron actually was like looking for uh, neurons which reacted to the phrase prime factors. Um, and, and so we're like, ah, great. This this neuron does <laughs> indeed distinguish prime or prime factors from all other types of primes or factors. And so we're like, we did it. We found the prime factors neuron. Um, we have won interpretability. Right. Then when, you know, upon further inspection, when we actually like, okay, you know, let's look at all the activations over a wider text corpus. I think this is 300 million tokens. Um, we're like, oh God, this is not a prime factors neuron. This This thing does so much more than this. How did you find the other engrams? Painstaking labor. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you could probably automate this, but for this very first one, I wanted to do it by hand. And yes, it took a long time. Anyway, so right, this is super annoying for us. It's just like, okay, what, what is this neuron actually? Uh, but this is obviously also problematic for the model because let's say, you know, internally the model is going to want to, it needs to distinguish between, you know, international covenants and research gates, right? And so how does the model actually distinguish? How does the model disambiguate between uh, all of these different engrams? And what we find is it does this through sparse combinations of neurons, each which also activate for these particular engrams of interest, but on sort of disjoint sets. So to make this a little bit more concrete, let's think about uh, the social security feature. So uh, this plot shows the activation of three different neurons, so these are three different neurons where this is their sum, but we'll get to that. Three different neurons on four different distributions. On the security token, when it's immediately followed by social, that, that's the blue histogram. Uh, on the security token, when it's followed by anything which is not social, this is the- uh, Preceded by, not followed. Pre oh yeah, sorry, preceded by anything. And then on any token, which is preceded by social, that is not security versus literally everything else, any other bigram, which does not include the social token or the security token. And note the log scale here. So, you know, the, the orange uh, histogram has like much, much more mass than than either of the other two. It is an enormous amount. I, I like to call it mount superposition. As we add neurons, we slowly climb our way out of it. Right. So what we found is with, with sparse probing, so, you know, let's imagine you train a three sparse probe to distinguish the social security feature from other types of security or other types of social. So literally we like had a supervised classification task where we wanted to classify the internal activations of a network on social security occurring versus other types of securities and other types of socials. And what came out of our three sparse probe are these three neurons where you can see individually these neurons do actually do a good job. Even a one sparse probe does quite well here, right? Even in looking at one of these neurons, you get reasonable separation, especially in these two, between the social security feature and uh, other types of securities and other types of socials. Of course, because these neurons are polysemantic, there's this much longer tail of orange activations. And so that's like, in this case, if you know, if we were probing for prime factors, like, ah, yes, we found a prime factors neuron, but there's all this stuff on the left tail of other things which cause this neuron to activate. And that corresponds to like this longer tail of, of orange histograms. The magical part comes when you sum these together. And so imagine, so this is before you apply the activation, but imagine you apply a, a JLU to each of these and then you sum the activations. And what pops out is perfect separation between the social security bigram and literally everything else. And I think one thing which is especially notable here is that we only train this probe to distinguish social security from 
essentially, yeah, we only train the probe to distinguish the blue histograms from the green and red histograms. Ooh. But I think what's amazing is that it actually also generalized to literally everything else, right? These are all all of the other possible biograms within our data set. And so I view this as even stronger evidence of superposition because here this shows that this probe essentially was like generalizing um, and that, you know, there, there aren't any other possible combinations of neurons, or sorry, there aren't any other combinations of tokens which like maximally excite these three neurons. Just a few clarifications on that. So you you just didn't have any text that did not contain social security in the, in the training mix at all? Gotcha. And the thing on the right is, is that the sum of the three neurons or is it this a is the probe? Sum. Okay, correct. So this is not a weighted sum. This is literally just the sum of the three neurons. So this is like gotcha. in some sense what the network sees rather than like, you know, what, what the probe sees. And can you unpack more why you see this as evidence of superposition? Right. So this is, this is a concrete prediction of the toy models paper for one that there's a sort of a spectrum of representations that you might expect a neuron to have. For features which are like prevalent or important, you might expect a dedicated representation, like a single neuron to prevent sort of interference from other features. But as you go through this sort of long tail of less important or less prevalent features, you would expect these to be, you know, distributed more across different neurons. And using a sparse set of neurons is most likely better for minimizing the interference between adjacent features. Um, because like you have this privileged basis, as you spread features across more and more neurons, like the more potentially interfering features you can have. Um, so that's one reason of like motivating sparsity. Another thing which we did to sort of validate this result was apply random rotations to the activations. And if sparse probes trained on the random uh, rotations did just as well as in the canonical neuron basis, then this would suggest that actually the neuron basis isn't that privileged and this is just like a really easy classification task and, you you know, this sort of sparse subset of neurons thing doesn't actually matter. Just, just um, um, briefly interjecting, I think there's a couple of concepts worth drawing out of that. So the first is the question of just does the neuron basis actually matter? Like we have this theoretical argument which we privileged, we have this empirical observation that things are polysemantic, and we have the hypothesis of superposition. But the superposition hypothesis does not actually distinguish between the world where ah, features are just arbitrary directions, man, models figure it out, versus features are like five neurons or like a hundred neurons, but they are not all 3,000 neurons. And you were describing an experiment, maybe you should go to the graph that was trying to test that. Right. So one experiment we did was compare how well uh, individual neurons uh, could classify particular engrams versus sort of random uh, combinations of neurons. And so in this plot, we are comparing, yeah, the classification performance of indi individual neurons on like our sort of bigram classification task versus a D by D rotation. And so the x-axis here corresponds to like the best neuron uh, or the best sort of random Gaussian, uh, uh, random combination of neurons um, plotted for, you know, uh, 50 different neurons or 50 different random projections. And where the y-axis is just, you know, how good of a classifier is it actually? And the, the legend here, this shows you the solid lines are in the sort of canonical neuron basis, and the dashed lines are in this random projection basis. And these are for the first four layers, uh, well, not including layer zero, uh, because we sort of observe this style of n-gram superposition to be most common within the early layers of a network. Which model is this? I believe this is, I think this is Pythia 1B, yeah. So this is a 16-layer network. Um, so this is like the first quarter. <laughs> This is surprisingly far apart. Like, this seems to be saying that if you remove the top 50 neurons in layer three, the next best neuron is about as good as a, the best neuron in some arbitrary basis. Right. And, and so, yeah, there are a few intuitions to be having here. One somewhat confounding factor is that, like, this just actually isn't that hard of a classification task, right? Like, this is distinguishing social security 
from any other types of security or any other types of social. And like, you know, there are probably lots of correlates that the model has access to in like making this uh, distinction. So like, you know, you might just be like picking up on a general politics feature uh, and anything having to do with like politics would like probably make the social security uh, feature fire more than, you know, most other types. I mean, maybe national security. So maybe this that's not a great example, but you can imagine for, for some of these other types, uh, the, the, the classification task is just not that hard. And therefore you could pick up on a bunch of correlates, which again, you know, this is why probing is uh, is is can be uh, can be bad. Just just making that a bit more concrete. Yeah. Um, there will be a direction in the residual stream saying the current token is pressure. Like that'll be there from the embedding. Other things might support it. There will be a direction saying the previous token was blood because there's a bunch of there are a bunch of heads that look at recent tokens or the previous token and. The sum of these directions is very plausibly going to be maximized on blood pressure. So in some sense, even without a neuron, the model has already learned to identify this. And this means that any neurons that just so happen to have OK cosine sim with that direction are going to be like reasonably predictive of blood pressure, especially if we assume that like, I don't know, um, the other things are training against, we've got like the pressure direction is there, but not the blood direction. The blood direction is there, but not the pressure direction. You can kind of think of this as just a three-dimensional space that we potentially live in, or like a 2D space with like a bunch of potential noise, many directions. And any given neuron, it's like got some contribution from blood, some contribution from pressure, and a lot of noise. And right. the question is, how good a classifier is it? So just to connect this back to the discussion of superposition, if it were the case that the neuron basis didn't matter, then we wouldn't expect a very large gap between the uh, classification performance of individual neurons and individual random projections of the neurons. But in all of these cases, we observe like a pretty a pretty big gap, right? And and given that this is a reasonably easy classification task, you know th th this gap seems fairly significant, and so this. Yeah, this again shows that the the neuron basis itself is independently meaningful, and there, there there's some neuron alignment of features that we're picking up on, and that this is sort of at least one underlying mechanism uh, powering superposition, right? This sort of allows you to use by by leveraging you know sparse combinations of neurons, you you get this combinatorial effect where you can sort of express many more features than you have dimensions. And so I think again a good intuition pump here is maybe something around names. So you know this yeah Pythia model only has you know a few thousand neurons per layer. It obviously knows many more people than that. And you can imagine like there there's like a sparse combination of neurons which react to each individual name and that it's you know, the sum of their output vectors then give information which is, uh, which corresponds to uh, that particular person. And so that's the way in which, you know, it's reacting to a particular pattern of engrams that then output the more semantically relevant feature. Um, and this is somewhat, this is sometimes known as detokenization. Uh, that, that this is the term that the uh, Anthropic Solu paper used, that a big part of what these early layers are doing is sort of going from token space, which is maybe kind of an unnatural language for a model to be thinking about. You know, the, the, the word social security means something very different than the token social and security separately. The model seems to be using early layers to go from this like atomic token space into a sort of more coherently semantic space um, that, is, that is more amenable for, for downstream processing and prediction. Yeah. All right. There were a couple of concepts in there that I want to try to disentangle. The first is behaviorally the idea of detokenization. The high level intuition here is that of sensory neurons. Just as our brains get raw data from the environment of like, weird sound waves in our ears and raw uh, retinal data from our eyes, it gets processed as some form we can actually use where we like recognize objects, can detect emotion, etc. And sensory neurons are the bits of our brain that do this. Image models have them, like Gabor filters are things you find in early layers of convolutional networks that detect edges. And detokenization is 
the hypothesized equivalent of sensory neurons for language models, because language models have the sensor sensory inputs of raw tokens, and they want to convert it into something that's meaningful. And I don't know, man, tokenizers, they suck. They're terrible. They're a complete mess. Like Harvard gets split into Har and Vard, as Wes has just brought us to. The language is full of random crap like this. Different words are always different tokens. And so models want to form a separate, models want to form a like internal, I think pseudo vocabulary was the term Wes came up with, that they can simulate that might be like much, much larger than the 50,000 they're given. And the second thing in that was the mechanistic claim of how models can do this. So in general, an open question when it comes to superposition, and in particular computational superposition, where multiple neurons represent something, is how is that being computed? In the naive case of a single neuron correspond to a single feature, you can kind of think of the jello as being a threshold. If the thing put into the neuron exceeds a certain thing, the neuron fires, otherwise it doesn't. The problem here is that if there's a bunch of neurons that each have their own linearity but a bunch of noise, how do you interpret this? What's going on? And the hypothesis is the model is doing some kind of binary compression scheme. Like, you can represent a thousand concepts with ten neurons by having one neuron activate for the first half, the next activate for every other one, the third activate for every one and three mod four, etc. And you can achieve really good compression. And the hypothesis is that neurons achieve detokenization via something kind of like this, where each neuron detects every compound word correctly, but it's pretty noisy. There's lots of other ones, and it's like not super accurate. Each compound word corresponds to different neurons, such that the combination of neurons that corresponds to a compound word is a good unique identifier. And this is importantly different from, say, um, I don't know, neuron one activates at this threshold, neuron two activates at this threshold, neuron three activates at this threshold, and their activations get added together in an interesting and complex way. And we're presenting the hypothesis that this is how superposition is implemented in a way that is useful in these neurons. How accurate was that? I think that was pretty accurate. I think that, yeah, one somewhat open question is like, well, okay, sure, these like three neurons seem to, you know, accurately uh, be able to classify, uh, you know, the social security biogram from all other possible biograms. But, you know, classification performance alone might not be enough, right? So, like, you know, if if these, like, directions carry some semantic meaning, like, we might want to sort of separate, we, want, we might want to achieve uh, additional separation between these histograms, right? Because otherwise, you still might have some amount of, you know, whatever else is in this other, other bigrams uh, category. Uh, you, you would still have lots of interference. And so, you know, one thing which... We did. Uh, we have a, a few results on in the appendix are on you know how much you know how many neurons are actually in superposition, um, and this again it's hard to study because there are all sorts of correlates and like you know the yeah the in this particular classification task is only um, classifying against uh, adjacent bigrams rather than all other possible tokens. Um, but I think that this is still kind of an open question. You know, is K three or three hundred? Uh, and, you know, maybe maybe at the long tail. Yeah. So ha just how to study that, I think, is still open. Do you have graphs in the appendix for this? As you can tell, I was an extremely attentive supervisor on this project. <laughs> yeah. So these are the graphs. All right. Well, the, no, yeah. yeah. So, OK, so let's zoom in here. Just look at the left for now. We're no longer concerned about classification accuracy because we're basically just assuming that it's almost perfect in terms of as a classifier, right? Once you achieve, you know, epsilon separation, perfect separation, separating these classes even more does nothing. And so we need a different metric. Um, and so the metric we use here is the logistic loss 
where because you know these are binary classes, we we want to achieve maximum separation in the probabilities. And so this gives us um th this is sensitive to the separation uh rather than just the amount of separation rather than just a uh, linear uh separation exists. And so this is now the out of sample logistic loss, not the training loss. On these compound word neurons, again, this is the same setup as the above plot. So this is Pythia 1b compound words. Um, this is the out of sample logistic loss as you vary the sparsity of the probe. And so for different amounts, so for different Ks, for different um, number of neurons, which you're allowed to use in your classifier, what is the sort of out of sample loss, which corresponds to how good of separation are you achieving? And where 10 squared probe sparsity means the probe can use 100 neurons. It precisely, so in yes. some sense, it's like the opposite of sparsity. Right, yeah. So this is maybe perhaps density is a better word. Which was a complaint Trenton and Brecken raised whilst we were reviewing this paper. But uh, we can't bother to change it to dense probes and also that. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> and so, but we appreciate the feedback. Yes, we always appreciate feedback. And again, same sort of axis, axes here with a uh, with a neuron basis and random basis uh, for for the different layers. And so, as you can see, you know, you do definitely get you, you. There, there are sort of two regimes that you can see. One is this power law scaling behavior, where you know you you get sort of a line on this log log plot, right? Hmm. And this this sort of corresponds to the intuition that there's this like long tail of potentially superimposed features which are like less and less and less helpful. Uh, but then for some of these, we we notice like a pretty distinct kink where uh, the returns of sparsity start to flatten out. And so one thing which you could hypothesize is that like this kink gives you the, the true K. I don't know how much I believe this partially because of all of the like issues that we discussed with probing and correlations and this being like kind of an easy classification task. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that this is very preliminary evidence that, you know, it might not, it might be greater than, you know, K equals three. It might be sort of more like 30. Um, but I think you would need sort of uh, a, a much more better setup to study this. This was, you know, something we kind of tacked on at the end as we were just like trying to, you know, just convince ourselves that, you know, we really found something. Um, and again, on, on, on the, uh, on the, on the right here, this is sort of comparing the, uh, the neuron basis versus the random basis. And again, the, the neuron basis is clearly more, um, is more meaningful. Uh, although the actual, you know, results here are like a little bit messy <laughs> as a function of probe sparsity, at least there, there was not really a super clear pattern. Yeah. And to be clear, these are all results on the test sets. Yes, these are all out of sample. Yes, this is yes. all out of sample test sets. Oh, it's so on the y-axis, yeah. my bad. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, so when we say this is an easy classification task, one way to think about it is, so like I was saying earlier, for say control group, there's going to be a current token is control direction. There's going to be a previous token, sorry, current token is group, previous token is control. It can be two separate directions. The sum of these is probably an okay control group classifier on its own. And so even before the neuron layer, probably a probe on the residual stream that's just taking those two things would get you acceptably good accuracy. Even if there's a bunch of noise, it's massively in superposition, and this is going to heavily interfere with a lot of other stuff, including control X and Y group, in addition to everything else. And so a natural question to ask is like, why does the model even need neurons? It has tokens. Every compound word you could ever care about is a linear can be represented as like a linear combination of tokens. And the hypothesis is that rather than social security being like a little bit further along this direction, but very noisy, the model wants to have some direction that's like five if social security is there and like zero if it is not there. And also where the okay. value of social security is not there is much closer to zero than being like minus three to three. Yeah, I so yeah, I, I and I also think that a big part of the story here is also the output, which we actually didn't study, but I think that this is sort of a natural next thing to study, right? Is that like the mere existence of the tokens control and group, it might just be like a, it, it, it might not actually confer any like semantic meaning of 
control group as a distinct entity. And so I view, you know, the the role of these early layers or detokenization neurons is like actually extracting this meaning from the mere existence of these compound words. Um, because, you know, for, for certain types of words, it would be hard to sort of cram in ever, every possible word sense that could exist for, you know, the, the token card or whatnot, right? And so these, these early layer neurons are detecting like, okay, which sense of card or group or health are we in? And then uh, again, I, I'm mostly speculating here, although there has been some preliminary work on this, uh, that, they, that they then output sort of the relevant uh, direction. When you say preliminary work, do you mean from you or someone else? No, I mean from uh, the the recent paper from Morjiva on uh, factual recall that mm -hmm. where yeah that implicated that the early layer MLPs and I think also yeah uh, I think there's also some work from David Bao that is suggestive along these lines. Yeah, I guess a natural control task could be probing for compound words that are not interesting, right? Like, or just like random tokens. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. The point about, is this actually intentionally represented is a pretty important one. So generally, if you're in a high dimensional space, any pair of vectors won't overlap that much. So even if there is a control group direction, an arbitrary vector shouldn't align with it that much. But when you've got four times as many neurons as you have residual stream dimensions, probably there'll be a bunch of things that align reasonably well. Though I should really actually figure out the distribution of this, because I might be talking complete bullshit. And again, probing is fundamentally correlational, not causal. And the question is, how does the model use this downstream? For that, you need to actually do something like causal interventions. The reason that I think the figure 2B, the four histograms, is like exciting, is this tells us that like not only are there three neurons that each kind of correlate with the social security feature but that the three of them together forms a feature that would be much more useful than each of them on their own, which both suggests there's something intentional about how the model has ended up structured like this, where intention means this is a configuration that Adam preferred because it got lower loss, because God knows Pythia 70 million is not sentient. Yeah, the fact that the three together is a much better detector is evidence the model actually uses this, though... For the most part, we failed to like actually do this properly. All right, your connection just died. Let's okay. re yeah. re restart. All right, sorry for the technical difficulties. I want to probe a bit into what exactly we mean by the claim that we have observed superposition with these four histograms. So on first glance, this is just like, yeah, it's obviously superposition. There's a bunch of caveats. So the first thing is that Probing is fundamentally correlational. In order to show their superposition going on, we need to go beyond just showing, well, these three neurons correlate with the social security feature. We need to show that the model is usefully using the fact that there are multiple neurons that all correlate with the social security feature for downstream computation. And it is not obvious that neurons which activate the most for social security will together be a much better classifier than either of any of them on their own are. And the fact that this is true is like pretty striking evidence that suggests the model is doing this intentionally for some very limited and anthropomorphic notion of intentionally, which to me is like reasonably good evidence this is actually something meaningful. But we didn't really do the proper causal interventions required for this in this paper. Unless I'm forgetting something, Wes. Yes. That's correct. The direction of future work yeah. that I'm hoping to get a chance to poke around at in the next few weeks. And the second thing, so as I was trying to explain at the start that got lost in the like half hour of random ass definitions, we have three related but different concepts. Polysmanticity, when a neuron means multiple things, which we've definitely seen here. Distributed representations where a feature is best represented as a linear combination of neurons rather than as a single neuron, which I argue we've shown pretty convincingly in 2B, except for the lack of causal interventions. And the third is superposition. The first two are more like local features. It's enough to exhibit a single example. Superposition is the broader claim that there are more features in total than there are neurons. 
and that this is mechanistically why we see the distributed representations and the polysemantist. And in my opinion, we have not fully rigorously shown this because we've shown there's a bunch of end graphs and we've presented theoretical arguments that there's just clearly way more compound words stored in the model than the model has neurons. But we've not actually shown there are more compound words than there are neurons. And sadly, I cannot convince Wes that we should do this for like several thousand compound words because Wes lacks <laughs> education and conscientiousness. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I, I would ask the listener to uh, <laughs> to introspect and try to come up with more than, I think, let's see, this is... Pythia 70M has like 2,000 neurons per layer? Per layer, Five yeah. Five layers? Yeah, six, six well, yeah, and, and layer zero. Layer um, zero is fake. So, yeah, I would, I would, yeah, ask the listener to try and come up with... Uh, a easy list of more than 10,000 engrams, and I claim it is not very hard. Uh, in particular, language is well known to like follow all sorts of like heavy tail distributions, and so I'm quite comfortable making the claim that there are more features than there are neurons uh, for any, yeah, current language model. It's like not entirely obvious to me for a 70 million parameter model. It's possible the model just is really, really bad. Yes. It still seems to know, uh, you know, various phrases which, where each individual token on its own does not like confer the whole meaning, and this feels like, you know, the model needs to be doing some sort of superposition to encapsulate all of these features. Yeah, I think that one is like actually a pretty interesting point. So, when we're discussing compound words, there's often a bunch of redundancy. For example. Eiffel Tower gets tokenized as E, IFF, EL, and Tower. But when you've got E, IFF, you probably know it's going to be Eiffel Tower. When you've got L, you definitely know it's going to be Eiffel Tower. Because Eiffel is basically never used in, in other contexts. And so the model kind of doesn't really need the, the full compound word detecting neuron. This is actually a much better example would be something like um, I don't know, Barack Obama, if Obama or Barack is a single token, uh, or Madonna, or something where there's just a single token that is basically just enough to identify what the thing is, such that even if there's other stuff associated with it, you don't need to really detokenize that properly. And I think all of the examples you studied here are like interesting in that it is genuinely ambiguous. And you need the context to distinguish, like social on its own and security on its own mean very different things from social security together, which suggests it's actually worth the model's while to represent them nicely. Right. And yeah, and just more generally, there's this, you know, very long tail of just like rare words with different types of prefixes, suffixes, conjugations, like, you know, there's so much variability to language or just like imagine a model that like knows chemistry well and like needs to know every combination of you know yeah molecular pieces and and and, and so in my mind it's it's fairly obvious that there are more features uh than there are dimensions or neurons that any competent language model would need to know about before i move on i just want to say that if anyone's listening to this and they're like I don't believe this actually shows superposition. <laughs> I would love for you to make a list of 10,000 n-graphs and go and ask <laughs> whether the model has it. And I bet you can show that it has more n-grams than it has neurons. And we can prove superposition to this unnecessarily high level of rigor. <laughs> It'll be great. I am very happy to tweet about any blog post that is like, we found more n-grams than neurons in this model. It's real superposition. Maybe the piece of evidence that I think has most convinced me this is a real superposition is that it's just a lot more efficient for a model to represent compound words in superposition than with individual neurons. And there is a long and beautiful FAQ that I wrote while in an unusually ADHD mood if you want several thousand words of glorious, glorious exposition about different concepts and superposition and how they're confused, 
the compound word or n-gram detection is actually pretty interesting because it's a special case of many things that make superposition unusually easy. One thing that is actually pretty important to disentangle when thinking about superposition is fundamentally, superposition is a trade-off between the desire to represent more features, because the more features you can represent, the lower your loss is. Like if you know that social security is a thing, then you will get better performance on texts involving social security. Because you can be like, oh, we're talking about welfare, or it's a bit more likely to be politicized, or instructions for people, or whatever. But there's interference, because the more things you're representing, if they're not orthogonal to each other, you can't read it out perfectly. There'll be other things that can mess with you. Let's say you've got two features, social security and control group, that both somewhat overlap. They're not exactly orthogonal to each other. What's going on? There's actually two different kinds of interference that can arise. When control group is there, but social security is not there, how do you tell that control group is there and that social security is not there? And if we look on this diagram and say social security is the diagonal up to the right one, control group is the horizontal to the right one, when control group is there, the projection onto the social security axis is like pretty tiny. So it's pretty easy to distinguish. In general, models are fairly good at distinguishing things where there's some direction where things close to the origin are negatives, they don't have the feature, and things far away on some direction are positives, they do have the feature. And there can be pretty wide ranges at the negative end because models are very good at extremizing things. Like, softmax tends to select the biggest out of a bunch of stuff. It doesn't care about if there's a bunch of noise, exactly how noisy it is. If you want to activate a neuron, you can just make it so it activates if things are above a certain threshold that's big enough to get rid of all of the noise. There's just lots of nice things you can do here. So this is alternating interference. Control group is there, social security is not there. How do you tell which one's which? And this is pretty easy, because models are good at extravising, having two cleanly separated things, even if it is not literally the case that the negatives are set to zero. But then, what happens if you have both social security and control group? In this case, you've got the, like, sum of the two vectors. And if Wes's mouse could beautifully demonstrate this, that would end up being, yeah, pretty far out which means the projection onto both things is, like, pretty limited. This means that, sorry, the projection onto both things is further out than you get by default. Like, control group plus social security looks more control group-y than just control group on its own. And this is kind of a pain from the model's perspective, because it doesn't want to fire th things that are trying to use control group it doesn't want to fire those more than it has to. It, it doesn't want to like fire those more by accident because social security is there. It's much harder to deal with interference on the positive end. And as a general rule, my intuition is that models really don't like simultaneous interference. Social security and control group at the same time, they're pretty good at dealing with alternating interference, one at a time. And if you look at the original toy models paper, they were looking at independent features, which appeared with which were non-zero with probability p. And they found that the smaller p was, the more the model, the more the models wanted to use superposition. I believe this is because alternating interference happens with about probability 2p, while because it involves something being there, which is unlikely, the other thing being not there, which is very likely. While simultaneous interference requires both things to be there. These are independent unlikely events, and that has probability about p squared. And so this tells you that as you make p small, the value of representing the feature also decreases with p, because the feature doesn't occur very often, it's not that useful. Alternating interference costs thus is about the same ratio to the loss reduced by representing the feature, but simultaneous interference is quadratic, and so that gets much less important which tells me that models really, really care about avoiding alternating interference. And n-grams are really well suited to this because, as you may have noticed, 
Social Security and the control group cannot occur at the same time, uh, which I noticed was a bad example, but it want to pivot in the middle. And this means that n-grams literally only have alternating interference because they're mutually exclusive. They cannot occur at the same time. The second property that's very important is that they are binary features. In the Toy Models paper, they studied continuous features that varied between 0 and 1, and tested a model for its ability to exactly recover the value of the feature. This is a very hard task to do with superposition, because if you look at the diagram above, if the horizontal feature is small, then that looks the same as the vertical up feature being big. And you just fundamentally cannot distinguish these, which means that even alternating interference is not lossless. However, if they are just binary, they are either on or off, you can perfectly recover this by just taking a threshold at, say, halfway along the x-axis. And this is this whole idea of, like, extremizing. If positive examples are much bigger than negative examples, everything's pretty good. And n-grams are binary. It's either there or it's not there. One kind of interesting subtlety here is that when I refer to a continuous thing, like uniform 0, 1, there's actually two different ways it can be continuous. One of them is it's literally continuous. It's something like height of an object or population of a city. This is like an actual numerical thing that can vary. And maybe the model actually has a feature that represents like the log of the population of a city. Um, I found features in the token embeddings that correspond to the number of characters in that token. Models do have continuous features, but there's a more subtle notion of continuous, which is like, this text is in French. Technically, whether or not a text is in French is a binary feature, but it's generally not going to be super obvious. There's going to be lots of different bits of evidence you have to accumulate. Like, is this English text with some French phrases in it? Is this weird garbled search engine optimization spam that happens to have a bunch of French accents in it? Is this an other language which happens to have similar syntax and like common words and subwords? And so to do this computation, you need to be accumulating many small pieces of evidence and tracking how they combine and add up. And this is a non-trivial thing to do. And you can kind of reason about this as a neuron firing for a continuous variable, where the ground truth is binary, but it's accumulating enough tiny pieces of evidence that it looks continuous. And n-grams are not continuous in the sense. Social security is on if social is there and security is there. You're not, you're not combining 100 pieces of evidence, you're combining two. So zooming out, two types of interference, alternating and simultaneous. Alternating is easier. n-grams only have alternating because they cannot occur at the same time. n-grams are binary. And n-grams are also kind of obvious in that they require only a very small number of pieces of evidence, each of which is very obvious, so they aren't even synthetically continuous. And one thing which is particularly interesting about this is that compound word detection and detokenization is just fundamentally the Boolean operation of and. And this is just like a very fundamental operation. Social is there, and security is there. This means that A, representing ands, which is probably a big chunk of what neurons try to do anyway, is actually very easy. The second is that models can do detokenization incredibly efficiently because of all of these facts that make superposition easier to do. And this just generally makes life better and happier and fluffier for the model. And to me, this is like my most exciting takeaway of this work. The theoretical argument that superposition should just work really well for neurons that are trying to do things like Boolean ands on a small number of variables, that detokenization, this really important task, corresponds to that. And so we should expect superposition, polysemanticity, and distributed representations to happen extensively in early layers. And further, that any approach like Solu that tries to totally remove um, superposition from a model will probably just significantly damage performance because this is just a big part of what the model is doing.
and uh, I believe Wes is going to show us this beautiful galaxy brain plot. Right. And so one thing that you can derive from this very simple construction is a mechanistic fingerprint for superposition. So uh, under this model, where we have binary and mutually exclusive features like n-grams, and you want to sort of embed them into a smaller dimension and then losslessly recover them. So that is like, you know, the losslessly recover the one hot vector. A natural way of doing this is by having uh, neurons with very large weight norms uh, and very negative biases. So the negative biases sort of correspond to killing all of this interference because it will get cleaned up uh, by a ReLU. So you need your, your bias to be negative enough to kill any interference. And you need your weight norm to be large enough to make this term large enough such that anything which is not projected onto this vector is large enough to uh, recover the actual feature. So yeah, you need the difference between uh, the, the projection of any interfering feature uh, to be large, and you need to be able to kill off uh, the signal of any interfering feature. And so uh, this corresponds to a large weight norm and a very negative input bias. If I can just try to draw a diagram that might make this easier. Yeah, please do. So, yeah, we've given this construction for how you could store five mutually exclusive binary variables in superposition losslessly. And the thing we do to recover this, this feature is we have a ReLU. ReLUs are basically half planes. They draw a line through the plane. Everything on one side is set to zero. Everything on the other side is kept the same. This is where the kind of vector of the ReLU is a thing orthogonal to the plane. This is just a geometric way of describing a row. You've got a line, every projection onto the line is the same if it's above, zero if beneath. And so all of the other variables get set to zero, while this one gets preserved as like its distance from this line. And if we imagine having like many, many features, uh, the construction we give just totally works for like, I don't know, basically arbitrarily many things around the circle. We might want to have like a really surgical ReLU like this. And this is notable because if we want the thing that comes out of the end to say have magnitude one for this feature, because this distance is so small, we need either the input or output weight of the ReLU to have like really big norm. So this is like big W, big W norm. And the second thing is that because this is very far from the origin, this means we've got a big negative constant offset. I can't actually remember why it's negative rather than positive, but YOLO, just take my word for it. <laughs> and so well, this- Because you need to subtract off the interference. Yeah, fair point. Yeah, it's like stuff here. Yeah, maybe this is supposed to be at the origin, so you need to subtract right. to get it there, and that's the negative bias. Yeah. So this is negative bias. And importantly, this is like a motif you should expect to see if superposition is happening in this like n gram e format. A further caveat is that the thing we're describing here is more like superposition that happens in the residual stream than superposition that happens in neurons. So uh, we don't actually explain this very well. So fundamentally, models are about computing features and using these features to compute more, more complex features until they can get to the eventual output. They go from like, this is social security, to this is um, text aimed at 50 year old mothers whose kids are going to university or something. And some like much, much more specific and niche feature. To do this, they need to do computation, which is done with the nonlinearities. Models have access to everything represented linearly, and we're doing some nonlinear stuff on top in order to produce new directions. And this is the thing we're focusing on in the paper. We're looking at MLP layers and we're looking at how the MLP layers are computing more features than they have neurons via weird compression schemes. But there's actually four times as many neurons than there are residual stream dimensions. And every layer adds onto the residual stream. In particular, there's 50,000 input tokens, but only about 1,000 dimensions in the residual stream. And so if you think of even each token as a separate feature, we know models can generally recover the input tokens. And the question is, how is this represented? The model needs to be doing some compression 
Because even though it's already computed the feature or is given the feature, it needs to be able to recover it. And this is called a representational superposition. And you can think of this as you've got a bunch of meaningful directions in some basis. How can you map them to a lower dimensional space linearly such that you can project back up to a higher dimensional space and recover? And this pentagon we've given is really about residual stream superposition. And this is the main focus of the toy models of superposition paper from Anthropic, which, I don't know, I find a little bit sad because to me, neural superposition is the interesting one because. That's the thing that makes us really bad at understanding models. While I'm more okay just saying, well, the residual stream is a compressed mess and it's kind of cursed, let's not think about it very hard. All right, now we're going to talk about the mechanistic fingerprints. Rambolo. Yeah, so as, as Neil sort of described the depiction he gave, yeah, showed that um, yeah, to losslessly recover these things, you need large weight norms and uh, very negative biases. And so, you know, this prompted me to actually look in you know, the Pythia bundles, you know, if you just take the product of the weight norm and the bias for each neuron, what does the distribution look like throughout the different layers? And what you see is this like very, very, very distinct drop in the early layers. Note that layer zero is a fake layer yes. because Pythia uses parallel attention, which is a terribly, terribly named thing. But what it basically means is that each transformer block contains an attention layer that moves information between positions and an MLP layer that processes information in place. And generally, attention happens, reads from the residual stream, writes to it. MLP happens, reads from the residual stream, including the output of the attention layer, and writes to it. The idea of parallel attention is, yeah, maybe I'll just draw a diagram. So you've got the residual stream, then you've got like attention, which adds to it, and MLP, which adds to it. The idea of parallel attention is that you get rid of this, and instead attention adds here, which means MLPs are basically reading from the same thing as the attention. They're like in parallel. Not any of the many other things parallel attention can mean because it's a terrible name. Uh, importantly, this means that for the zeroth layer, where you have the token embeddings, the zeroth MLP layer whose job is to process information in place and cannot move information between positions is totally fucked because it only sees the token embedding. And fundamentally, the token embedding is just a lookup table. The token embedding just tells you, okay, for every possible token, which vector in the residual stream should it correspond to? And it can do this maximally expressively because every token gets its own set of premises. So MLP0, which is purely a function of the input token, can purely produce another vector in the residual stream for that token, and thus is basically completely useless, and should be thought of as just an extended embedding, apart from the fact that it lets tension zero see a different kind of embedding than what everything else sees. And maybe Wes wants to push back on whether it's completely useless. I mean, it's an extended embedding, uh, and so, you know, it could... Yeah, it could allow you to to yeah have some information uh, which is outside the embedding. Uh, but I I don't want to claim that it's especially uh, this is an especially useful feature. And in this context, it makes it such that you know because these are because layer zero is just a property of the current token, it can't be implicated in any sort of n-gram superposition, and therefore sort of our weight uh, times bias back, norm times bias uh, metric uh, does not show anything notable in layer zero. It's a fake layer, is how I think it, about it. Yeah, it's it's or an extended embedding. Um, this may be a nicer way of putting it. Ah, but extended embedding can be doing something interesting with attention as well. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, I don't really know. Call it an extending embedding. Yeah, but but so we see that yeah, these early layers are clearly doing something qualitatively different than all of the other layers. Uh, that the, that their weight statistics are just like systematically skewed across scales. Uh, and we also looked at the at, at some GBT models and this also replicated. And so, yeah, so so this is quite suggestive. Uh, I don't think that other other than just the other superposition results we have um, and and these sort of uh, the fingerprint from the toy models, uh, we don't have 
any other sort of uh, explanations for what this could be, but uh, th there definitely seems like there could be things uh, other than superposition which explain this effect. It also seems plausible that there are sort of other mechanisms of superposition other than just like this decoding strategy, which is perhaps most amenable to n-gram detection, which we would most expect in the early layers. So we think that this is quite suggestive, but I think it would be really exciting if someone could either come up with alternate theories for like what explains this consistent uh, norm and bias effect, uh, or if people could sort of discover other sort of fingerprints of superposition. Um, because naively, we sort of make, we conclude that this implies something about the early layer neurons uh, being, leveraging more superposition than later, later layer neurons. Um, and maybe one intuition I have here is again, just, you know, names or just the, 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 the just sheer token space is so vast. It's so vast. All possible n-grams just, it's, it's just, there's, there's so many potential things that you might want to represent. Whereas if you, if you imagine like every feature, which you might want to re represent for any particular person, uh, this is probably lower dimensional than, you know, all possible names. And so you could imagine going from raw token space of people to like feature space of people, it, it's a smaller dimensional space and therefore leverages less superposition. Um, this is a story which I would believe, but this is purely based on intuition rather than any empirics other than those displayed here. A couple of takes. Uh, the sure. first is the viewers may notice that this graph is weird because it's got fewer layers than the thing above it and the thing below it. This is entirely the fault of whoever decided on the hyperparameters for the Pythia suite. The one billion parameter model has fewer layers than the models before or after, which have the same number of layers, despite having 4x the parameter difference. And I have no idea why this is a thing, but it annoys me. The second observation is there's also this kind of interesting peak at the end that seems to be happening in like most models, apart from the cursed model. No, it so, doesn't also happen in the know, doesn't, model. It doesn't yeah. happen in the biggest one as well. No, yeah. I, mean, I, I think that this is actually a really interesting inconsistency. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, the final thing I want to posit is that Trenton actually raised an interesting counterpoint, which is that this motif is actually more described as... Our explanation says that this is actually a decoding from superposition motif more than it's an encoding into superposition motif or a mm. doing computation in superposition motif. So I guess to push back against that a little bit, I think it's still consistent with the like recognition of a distinct feature in superposition uh, motif. And therefore, and the additional assumption I'm making, which mm -hmm. this does definitely does not show, is that uh, that is then outputting like the sort of detokenized, semantically meaningful version of mm -hmm. this. But just from this plot alone, we don't show that. Makes sense. Yeah, maybe my current interpretation of this finding, though, more broadly, I think the right takeaway from this section, it's just like, lol, what? That's not a thing that we would have predicted a priori. That's interesting. There's probably some explanation of this. My story is that this is actually a sign that detokenizing that token embeddings are very heavily superposed and that detokenization is about decoding that from superposition and yeah that is my story behind that mm -hmm. so this isn't actually telling us that much about how the detokenized outputs are represented in superposition or computed in superposition um it's actually like thinking through this it seems like if you're doing some kind of compression scheme where one neuron represents like 10 different inputs, it's not even obvious to me that you want your bias to be that negative or that you want your input weights to be that big. Well, I view a negative bias as being important for killing interference. Hmm. Um, this is just like my general mental model for, yeah, what like a negative bias in, in this situation would do. And this feels like, pretty generally useful. Makes sense. I'm so curious what the hell is up with the positive bias. The plausible, I don't know. This is like weight norm times bias is just like a very weird summary statistic. Right. And so. 
I wouldn't be hesitant about drawing too much from this. Right. Especially, especially these sort of later layers where, you know, it could just be something where there's like a natural bias in the model and that, you know, at various points, yeah, this is like above or below the sort of canonical scale of, uh, of the weight matrices. And so it's, yeah, depending on the, the initialization or just whatever training dynamics of the model, it might end up being above or below this by a little bit. Yeah, actually, maybe the plot that I really want to see is like a scatter plot of bias against weight norm colored by layer or something. Because, I don't know, the thing at the end could be driven by the weights become bigger and the biases were already a little bit negative, a little bit positive, and it just gets skewed. I don't know, there's a separate thing where, to me, the product of weight norm, of input weight and output weight norms is like the right unit. Because if you're treating the thing like a jello, yeah. if you're treating it like a relu, then like doubling the input and halving the output and also scaling the bias should be like about the same. Yeah, no, I I mean, I definitely think that there are, are better things to be doing here. I think this was really just driven by the observation in the toy models that like, you know, if you were to do this, this is this would be like, you would observe this. And so I just tried plotting it. And indeed, we we did observe something interesting. Um, and so there's clearly something going on here. The exact mechanism... I don't want to make too strong a claim that this is like, you know, definitely superposition and there's definitely more superposition in early layers because of this. Um, but this, this, yeah, there's clearly something interesting is going on in the early layers, which is qualitatively different. Makes sense. Yeah. It would also be very interesting to go and actually investigate the neurons at the tails of either of these. That would feel like a pretty cool project. All right. So rounding off part two, we did sparse probing on how models detect compound words like social security. We have theoretical arguments for why these are like unusually well suited to superposition and that models should be able to get a ton of superposition done in these. We then show in practice that neurons which detect these seem insanely polysemantic and which are like reasonably good detectors of compound words for like a lot of different compound words. Secondly, we seem to have some real superposition here. We have multiple neurons that are mediocre social security detectors, but just their sum is suddenly a much better one, suggesting that not only are there many neurons that activate for the same thing, but that it's useful to the model that many of them activate for the same thing. And finally, we present arguments that this is like actually superposition rather than just like, well, it's a polysemantic neuron that's distributed and the feature is distributed across a couple of neurons, but really it's just as like weird rotative basis, who cares? We both provide evidence that the neural base is actually meaningful and an arbitrary rotation gets you worse performance. We also argue that just like, I don't know, man, so many end graphs. Clearly, clearly, models want to represent more of these than they have neurons. And because they are binary and mutually exclusive and require a small number of bits of evidence, this is just really easy to represent superposition, suggesting that this is like a big efficiency gain and a big part of model performance. And we present some highly speculative evidence that I think I'm now less convinced by than Wes's, that this is like what's happening on a global level. But more generally, models are going to spend a bunch of their time in early layers converting raw tokens to a more meaningful pseudo vocabulary that's whatever they find useful. This seems to be well implemented by superposition. Models want to do a lot more of it than they have neurons. And so this seems like a prime candidate for doing superposition. And in my opinion, this is like the first real exhibition of superposition in language models, where we both exhibit distributed representations that has very rarely been done before. I think there's like one or two papers in LSTMs that have maybe done this. And we also argue that this is like really because of superposition. Anyway, cell switch over. This is a mentee's paper, so I get to big it up because I'm like a proud parent rather than an arrogant dick. Anyway, <laughs> on to part three, where we talk about everything else in the paper, which is much less popular.